Hello, everybody, and welcome back to more Yanosos. So glad you're here. So, in this video, I recently took a trip to Dayton, Ohio. And I know what you're thinking. Why would you ever go to Dayton, Ohio? Uh, it was a work trip, so I didn't really have a choice. But, come to find out, there is a United States Air Force National Museum there. Um... Dayton, Ohio it was a bit of a drive. I wish I had flown, but the benefit of driving was I was on my own schedule completely. So our last day there, we uh, got off at around noon and I had heard rumors about how cool this museum was. And I thought, you know what, rather than head immediately home, I'm going to check it out. So that's what I did. And I'm so glad I did. Uh, it was worth the six hour drive there and back to Dayton. Um, I hate driving it. <laughs> First of all, something about driving puts me to sleep. Secondly, I'd much rather somebody else be the one in charge when it comes to that. You know, I'll, it's not about the time necessarily. It's about the action. Um, you know, I'll take a train, I'll take a plane, I'll take a bus, you know, just, I want somebody else to handle the paying attention part. You know, I'm just on the edge of my seat for self-driving cars. They're so close. They're so close. I can't wait to get one. Anyway, I went to this museum. It was fantastic. Dayton, I, I would put Dayton on your vacation destination just for this museum. It's right next to uh, Wright, Wright Patterson. Yes, Wright Pat Air Force Base. Uh, it's off the base, so you don't actually go on the base to go to the museum. It's completely free. You just walk right in. Uh, you, you would need, I would need probably at least two or three days to get through this whole thing. I'm a slow reader. Uh, if you read fast, maybe you could get through it in about a day and a half, but it's huge. They just have hanger after hanger after hanger of all this stuff. And every single one of them is packed to the brim and they've got static displays on the outside that I didn't even get to. Uh, you saw them when you were driving up you're like, Oh, there's an F-15. There's a C-17. There's a, you know, whatever else. I think they had an A-10 outside too. It's just, it was nuts. And not just the planes they have, there's a whole surrounding grounds. There's like a park outside with all these plaques and things. There's just so much to see. I had five hours. I think I got there at 1230 or 1300 and it closed at what? 1700, five o'clock. And, uh, yeah. So I, by the end I was just basically sprinting through the thing cause they were making announcements, you know, you got 30 minutes, you got 15 minutes left. And I'm just like, gotta see this gotta see this. And plus, on top of that, my GoPro was totally running out of batteries. I don't know. I've got four batteries for the thing. And uh, one of them just didn't work. So I was down to three. And you'd think that would last a while, but, uh, you know, you'd think three batteries would last five hours. But GoPro batteries drain like a bathtub. So anyway, let's dive right in. This was fantastic. I got, I counted, well, I didn't count. My computer counted. I got 426 photos to go through. This is the first one. I've already spent three minutes and 23 seconds talking about it. So let's just dive right in here. Um, I gave these a quick look through. Um, but I'm not going to sit there and, uh, you know, read every sign to you, read every placard. Um, also, another thing, uh, if, you've, if you're a watcher of my videos, you know that I've had trouble playing pictures and VLC and syncing up the audio, synchronizing the audio. So I'm just going to watch these on my screen and click through. So you're going to hear some mouse clicks in the audio. You're just going to have to deal with it. I'm not even going to try to edit those out. Let's jump right in. Okay, so the way they're organized, they basically have the museum organized by time. So they've got like a hangar of World War I, then like a hangar of World War II. Then the Southeast Asia War, a.k.a. Vietnam. Then they've got like a Cold War hangar. And then they start getting into the modern stuff. Um, you know me, I'm more of a modern buff kind of person. That's the world I live in. Uh, but man, it was really interesting and sad, quite frankly, to walk through definitely World War One, definitely, definitely World War II. Um Anyway, I'll talk about that when we get there. So this was the first picture I took inside. Uh, these were some coats that World War I pilots wore because, you know, this was long before pressurized cabins. <laughs> it gets cold up there. 
you got to bundle up. You know, it's like diving. You, you watch my scuba diving videos. You go down under the waves. It's cold down there. Um, yeah, you know, come to think of it, it'd be really awesome to get a pressurized bubble to take down with me. Uh, so I wouldn't have to, you know, wear the wetsuit or the dry suit. But anyway, you get up not even that high and uh, it starts getting cold quick. If you've ever done some hiking on mountains, you can attest to that. And that's way lower than even World War One planes were flying. So you can imagine how cold it could get. Here's a World War One plane. You can see the drop top in action, convertible style. <laughs> Long before pressurized cabins. Um, as we're going through these, by the way, I'm not even going to pretend to know what each of these planes are. Uh, my strategy as I've seen just glancing through the pictures was to take a picture of the plane, then take a picture of the placard. So scrolling through in real time, I'm not going to know what they are. Even if I read the placard first, I mean, you could make up a name. I wouldn't know the difference for most of these, certainly the older planes. Um, you know, I love aviation and things like that, but I'm by no means a uh, expert, a guru gearhead for planes. Airhead, is that what it's called for planes? Anyway, this was, uh, you know, static display. You can see the plane size in relation to the maintainer size. Very small, very small. Moving on. Oh, this guy. So, you know, my plan was to, like, let you pause the video and zoom in and read some of these things. But I just don't know if that's going to be possible with, uh, since I'm doing the slideshow on YouTube. So let me zoom in here. This is not something you're going to see in the video, but this is Don S. Gentile, the one man Air Force. Uh, so just uh, free, uh, freelancing here. It sounds like he was an ace in World War II. And an ace is a. Uh, wait, does it actually say ace in here? Probably an ace. Uh, I'm not going to read it in real time here. But. The guy won a lot of medals in World War II, and I took some pictures of him. Um, just reading some of the names here. Army of Occupation, Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross. That sounds like a good one. Uh, just fantastic. I can't imagine the bravery of these people just flying in these, you know, rickety small planes. Uh, you got a lot of trust in the uh, engineers at the, in, at the day, and that's... Still true today, actually. Uh, we get back. So an ace, I actually had to Google this because I was actually confused about one part of it. So an ace is somebody who's down five enemy combatants. I thought, I, what I didn't know was if it was in one day or career. And I think the answer to that is career. Uh, let's move along, though. There's his, there's his medals on the, on the right side. <laughs> this guy won a lot of them. Uh, British. 1933 to 1945 star British war medal. Yeah. So this guy was pretty much your uh, aviation stud back in world war two. And you know, I'm a little confused. I thought this was the world war one hanger. So anyway, moving on to some engines here. Look at that sucker. See, I would call these rotary engines, but I don't think that's right. Uh, I think there's a placard that called them elliptical engines, maybe. But this is all World War I stuff. Uh, this was actually the last one in the line. If I go to the next picture, yeah, you can see them kind of lined up here. And the start is on the left side, so I kind of came at this at the wrong angle. Next, um, ABC Wasp engine. Yeah, look at that sucker. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. No, seven. <laughs> I can't count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, yeah, seven cylinders, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Would you even call those cylinders? I don't know. I'm not an engine guy. Anybody know engines? All right. Now, this this looks like your, you know, was that V12 big block or something? I don't know. <laughs> that is the Renault 12 Fe engine. It's the Fe. And uh, aircraft engines, World War One. See, I should have started here. I started on the right side. They, they should organize that better because you come in on that side or you come in at that door that part of the hangar and you're already at the end of the list they should put you at the beginning but yeah look at this throughout world war one engineers tried to make aircraft engines more powerful lighter and reliable imagine that 
the warring nations produced many innovative designs in a short period of time to improve aircraft altitude, speed, and endurance. Sounds just like it is today. Oh, this one. <laughs> um, oh, I actually didn't notice this until now. What are those green, white, and red flags? Is that Italy? Oh, gosh. Somebody's going to slay me in the comments for that. Yeah, if you know what flag that is, please drop a line in the comments. But what I do remember from this is, this is a bomber. This is a World War One bomber. <laughs> so you think of our bombers today, like, you know, the most advanced bomber in the world right now is the B-2, soon to be augmented by the B-21, whose release date to the public is December 2nd. Um, that is a competitive, uh, competing company, but I am very much looking forward to that revealment for a number of reasons. <laughs> Uh, I just want to see what it looks like, <laughs> first of all. And I'll stop there. But th look at this. So, you know, B twenty one or uh, B B two was introduced in what late eighties, early nineties, maybe. I mean, you can go back a hundred years, and this is what it looked like. Not even a hundred years. Probably, I don't know, eighty five, ninety years, and this is what we were flying with next. Um, Oh yeah, so I tried to keep my pictures grouped in, um, you know, like, uh, you know, try to keep them together, but I failed. So th this is the wing on a totally different plane, and then I'm gonna go back to the bomber. I'm sorry, I, I should have done a better job of organizing this, but I didn't. So this is the wing from what does that say? DH-48, piloted by Captain Street. On his famous Alaskan flight. Oh, yeah. I think I took a picture of the placard later. Oh, no. Right now. <laughs> the first Alaskan flight. Went from the U.S. to Alaska. was made... Oh, so this is the first flight from the U.S. to Alaska. Man, those guys are brave. Can you can you imagine getting in something, a little plane like this in 19, whatever year this was? That is incredible. These guys have some cojones. Ah, back to the bomber. <laughs> so it had some, what are those, wooden propellers? Man, if you look at propellers, so I got a picture of a few propellers coming up here. And, oh, what is that sound? Oh, that's my ice maker. I'm sorry. If you can hear that, that's my ice maker injecting water into the thing. But propellers, man. Are there any aeronautical engineers out there that want to explain this to me? Because every, every propeller I've ever seen looks totally different from the one before it. Some of them don't even look like they push air, you know? Like, the propeller that I'm familiar with is your basic ceiling fan, you know? And those blades are tilted slightly. And you would think that'd probably be what a plane propeller would look like. But no, they're vastly different. Vastly different. Some of them don't even look like they push air at all. So it must be something when you get going fast that, I, I don't know. I'd lo I, I love to hear a... Uh, you know, a 30,000 feet view of propeller design. I think that'd be very interesting. See, look at this propeller. That, that sucker is, the angle on that is so bad. It looks like it doesn't even do anything. And again, that's wooden. I, I, I assume in World War I, you had carpenters in workshops that were, you know, pulling out their fine grit sandpaper and smoothing these things out. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's just crazy how far technology has come. Is this a biplane? Just two wings? Does that mean it's a biplane? I th think that's what it means, but I don't know. So, please enlighten me in the comments below. Uh, yeah, so like I said, I got into the got into the uh, groove of taking a picture of the plane, then taking a picture of the placard. So I guess what you just saw was a Lusac Eleven. I'm not going to sit here and read all these to you. Uh, that text is big enough. You should be able to pause and read if you are interested. Next. Oh, here we go. Here's a propeller attached to a big block. One, two, three, four, five, six. V12, baby. <laughs> is that your Lamborghini engine sitting there? I don't know. I imagine a four-cylinder now probably produces more horsepower than that thing did. But moving on. Uh, that's another picture of the bomber. Oh, that's the, uh, I guess, the forward-facing gun on the bomber. That was probably for self-defense. Um, next. 
Ah, got into the bomb sites. So, again, this is something I never even knew existed until I went to this museum. Uh, so if you can kind of read that, I think the placard's coming up in the next frame. But basically, these are bomb sites, which I guess let you look overhead, or while you're flying overhead, look down and aim your bombs. You know, obviously, this is long before GPS and precision-guided munitions. And uh, this is going to come up again in the uh, World War II section, but I guess they got started in World War I. And I guess these are actual bomb sites from World War I. And yeah, here's the placard. The engineering division worked with Sperry Gyroscope Company to develop a bomb site designed by Alexander P. Seversky. Completed in 1924. 1920, okay, so 1924 was after World War I, so... Okay, this must have been a lead up to World War II. And there is a U.S. Army plane that looks like it came straight out of Minecraft. <laughs> very boxy, very boxy. Look at those wheels, baby. I think my bicycle has better tires than that. Moving on. Ah, this is the Model T Ford Ambulance. So, yes, I did a little cheating, looked ahead. Yeah, this was an ambulance for war, for World War I. Uh, next, yeah, here we go. Model T ambulance. Jeez, I can't even imagine how awful it must have been to fight in wars like that. Uh, light wooden body. So this thing was made out of wood. Jeez, four-cylinder engine produced 20 horsepower. Wow. No self-starter. The engine had to be hand-cranked. <laughs> That's got to be fun. All right, now there's a view from the side. We've got the spare tire, and uh, geez, woe to the man who was in the back of that thing. I cannot even imagine. Here's the domino plane, <laughs> or the uh, uh, what's black and white? Uh, I said dominoes, I don't know. Moving on, there's another small little biplane. I guess that's the P6E. Any P6E experts out there? Enlighten me. Okay, starting in 1925 with the P1. Curtis built Curtis. Is that the Curtis from Curtis Wright? I wonder. Hmm. All right, like I said, not going to read all this to you. Inter Years War. So this was in between World War One, or, uh, yes, not in between. Yes, in between. Between, in between. Is there a difference difference between between and, and in between? I don't know. I don't know if there is. Anyway, this was 1925, I think I saw. Oh, 1930s, 1933. Edward S. Perkins of Anniston, Alabama. Check that out. Donated it to the museum. Oh, okay. 600 horsepower. Not bad. Oh, look at this sucker. <laughs> so I saw this and I did a double take. I was like, what, what? Um, this was like the first V-22 Osprey. <laughs> so they were trying to do a, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I got COVID like five weeks ago and I'm still like nasally and coughing stuff up. And I just, man, I, this might be the rest of my life now. I don't know. So I'm going to try to cut out my coughing and things, but excuse me, pardon me if I, you know, you hear me rasping a little bit and uh, coughing a little bit. Um, but yeah, back to the airplane. So this is like a, we're about to find out when I look at the placard. Uh, they were trying to take a short vertical takeoff or trying to create a short vertical takeoff airplane. And this is what they came up with. <laughs> they got a prop in the front and a big prop on the top. And the prop on the top is actually not powered, I think. Let me go to the next. Yes, the K2, K3. Uh, before World War II, engineers sought to build an aircraft capable of making, yes, short takeoffs and landings. I mean, we still have the same thing today. With uh, The Harrier was kind of the first jet engine, I think, that did it. And the F-35C? can never keep the letters. The F-35A is the Air Force version. I can't remember between the B and the C which one is Marines and which one is Navy. But the Marines, you know, they got the whole thing where the actual jet engine nozzle on the back rotates, 
90 degrees and points down and a big door opens up at the top so a lift fan can get in you know input air it is freaking nuts man like yeah uh, i don't know how they designed that all that on a common airframe i mean rotating a jet nozzle 90 degrees cannot be an easy task anyway back to the uh plane at hand here yeah let's read it. you probably already had time to read this if you're ignoring me uh, Wallace Brothers manufactured 12 K2 gyros. Uh, unlike helicopters, the engine did not power the auto gyros rotor. Instead, aerodynamic forces made the auto gyro rotor spin. That's crazy. So I guess you started going forward and aerodynamics made the thing on top spin just by receiving the incoming air. And I guess it provided lift and gave this thing a, uh, you know, little boost on short takeoff. That's pretty ingenious, to be honest with you. But check it out. The K2, K3 was the first Osprey tilt rotor. Well, it didn't tilt. <laughs> the first Stovall short takeoff and landing aircraft. No idea what this is. Moving on. So, yeah, here's my picture with all the props. Uh, I did not walk down and try to read these. Like I said, I was on a time crunch. But just look at all those different props. I mean, who knows what each one of those does? It, what are the advantages over them? I, I guess aeronautical engineers of the day, and I, I doubt they had like wind tunnels. I don't know what their grasp on mathematics was. It must have been pretty good. There's no way they had any, you know, they obviously had no kind of modeling like we have today. I mean, you know, you can go on a computer, design a prop, spin it up, you have a simulation environment that will very accurately tell you you know, it's performance. They didn't have anything like that. So I wonder how much of this was, was, uh, just like grasping at straws and how much was, you know, actual physics backing. Uh, pretty incredible, pretty incredible what they did. And here's some random U S army airplane. Again, if you know what that is, drop me a line in the comments. Ah, this one came out blurry. You know, I was, this is the, prop plane with the uh you know helicopter on top uh if you can see that it's blurry and here's another rotary engine what is that one two three four five six seven eight nine cylinders did i count that right i'm not gonna recount so looks like a lot of power to me this is the Wright R1820 Cyclone engine. Cyclone, that's what they are. I've been saying rotary. Cyclone, I think, is the uh, right term. Yes, nine-cylinder. I counted correctly. <laughs> R1820 radial engine in 1931. Incredible. Yeah, th so this is interesting. The larger, more powerful produced... 575 horsepower engineers dramatically improved its performance over many years. You know, I wonder like how different they went from 575 to 1525. I mean, what is that? It's like 150% increase, right? And you would think something that vast would need like a whole system redesign. So anyway, moving on, I guess this is the, uh, first blue angels plane <laughs> it's painted in the right colors i'm kidding i'm pretty sure this is not a blue angels plane but the uh, blue and yellow it's a good look it's a good look finding the way yes uh so basically this says once people started flying they had a hard time figuring out where the hell they were going <laughs> and they relied on Landmarks and things, but when you're flying over open water, there are no landmarks. So they, I guess the U.S. Army at the time, yes, this was before the Air Force even existed, opened up a navigation, or, uh, navigation, not, yeah, sorry, navigation school. And who knows how that worked. Yeah, I can't imagine flying around with that GPS. I, <laughs> GPS started becoming a thing right when, right when I was in high school. And when I was in high school, it was still, we still did the MapQuest thing, you know. You didn't have the in-car GPS. I I had, actually went out and bought a handheld GPS, which was like for hiking and things. That was like 140 bucks, I think, 120 which 
you know, when you're in high school, that's, that's a lot of money. And it was cool. You know, I just wanted this cool GPS thing. And it was, oh, I s- still have that thing here somewhere if I could find it. But, uh, oh, it was, uh, I, I can't imagine like flying without GPS, much less, or driving without GPS, much less flying. Uh, I was, uh, it's nuts. It's nuts. I don't know how people navigated back then. Compass landmarks and know how, I guess. All right, but these are some bombs from, I guess, World War 1930s, in between the wars. <laughs> All right. We got a white one on the left and two yellow ones. Don't, probably don't want those falling on your head. Yeah, we got a silver plane here with a red nose. I'm sure we're going to find out what this is. Nope, I did not take a picture of that placard. All right, Proving the Flying Fortress. Uh, There's no way you guys are going to be able to read that, even with the glare. So I assume this is a lead-up to maybe the B-17, because that was the nickname for that thing. But I'm not even in the World War II hangar yet, so moving on. Here we go. This is the, I think, first picture. Maybe the last one was of the World War II hangar. And all right, yeah, they had a... This was kind of the hallway leading into the hangar, I guess you could call it. Or maybe the anti-room, anti-room. They had some, you know, Jewish things from back then. And it was just terrible. I mean, you look at this quilt, you know, with the Stars of David. And uh, if we zoom in, you can see never again on a lot of these squares. And that, you know, this is an aside. This just makes me think about what's happening right now with this Russian invasion of Ukraine, and it's just awful. It, This is putting knots in my stomach. It, it's one of the most unjustified atrocities that I've seen in my lifetime, I think. I'm late 30s, and I was thinking about this. There, there's been war most of my life, most of since I've been alive. You know, if you can go back, I guess, and there... Uh, I was born in 85. I guess the Cold War came to an end in, what, 91? You know, I don't really remember that. I, th- I think the first war I remember was the Gulf War. Um, And then there was relative peace, I guess, at least, you know, from the United States standpoint. And then, you know, 9-11 happened, and we were in the Middle Eastern quagmire for 20 years. And uh, it, it's just... It, you know, at least those wars had some semblance of justice to them. And when February 24th happened this year, it, it just blew my socks off. I, I just could not believe that this, that this was happening, you know, in 2022. Um, you know, they said never again at the end of World War II and here we are again, you know, like Putin, as far as I know, has not set up, you know, death camps, but this war, you you have what a sitting member of the UN security council, just totally, totally unjustified invading another sovereign country, posing absolutely no threat to them whatsoever. And just, lie after lie after lie that he's spewing to justify his invasion. It just, I'm sorry. It, it's, it's really starting to upset me that this kind of thing still happens. And, uh, never again. I mean, here we are, it's happening again. <laughs> you know, I've come to the conclusion in my semi short life so far that, Wars, at best, solve problems for a single generation. That's it. You hope the war solves a problem for your generation. Because the next one comes along, they either don't know or don't care about history, and it's all the same stuff all over again. And, you know, here we are. And Putin basically laid out as what Mein Kampf of Ukraine doesn't exist as a country, you know, doesn't exist as a society, as a culture. And, uh, it's just, it's scary. It, I mean, (laughs) 
thank goodness we're doing what we can to counter that. But I just, my heart is in knots for the people of Ukraine who have to endure this, who didn't pose a threat to anyone. And some bully just decided that, hey, I want to own that land. You know, I want to bring back the Soviet empire. I mean, that's what this is about. He's spewing all that crap, whatever he's saying, who knows? They're Nazis and they're going to, they're a threat to Russia. Yeah. Little Ukraine is a threat to Russia. I mean, the reality is he just wants to, what did uh, Carl Sagan say? So that uh, in the moment of glory and triumph, he can become a momentary master of a fraction of a dot. I mean, that's that's Putin to a T. He wants to become a momentary master of this little country of Ukraine. And, you know, he wouldn't stop there. His goal, what I think, you know, he wanted to bring back the entire Soviet empire. And Ukraine, to him, was going to be the warm-up, you know, because he had his eye on NATO. I know he did. And <laughs> he can't even take Ukraine. NATO would totally wipe the floor with this guy. Totally wipe the floor. And he's been humbled. <laughs> He'll never admit it. But he's, he really thought he had something that could take on NATO. I know he did. And, uh, yeah, he was expecting to, what, take Ukraine in three days? <laughs> Yeah, he was going to take Ukraine in three days, set his sights on Poland. And uh, yeah, where do we are now? <laughs> Month nine in his three-day war. Um, sorry, I shouldn't be laughing. It's just, it, it, it wrecks my heart to know that we're still doing this to one. What people are capable of doing to one another willingly, just so they can lord over somebody else. I I, I will never understand it. Thank God I won't. Um, but Ukraine, was it Slava Ukraine? We're with you. All free peoples of the world are with you. We support you. We love you. And uh, hopefully never again. But all right, I'm off my soapbox. Let's keep going. This is going to be the longest video of my life. <laughs> Uh, there's just another picture of the quilt. I don't know who made this quilt. I assume it's circa 1942. And here we go. Major Nazi concentration camps. So, so I did peek at this list before the video. And uh, I'm zooming in so I can read. You guys are not going to be able to do that on YouTube. Uh, I, I was surprised, honestly, how many concentration camps were in Germany. I, I always kind of figured they were further west i guess uh but look at i mean auschwitz everybody knows auschwitz that's in poland of course yeah oh, geez look at these I, I just i i just i can't imagine what kind of hate you have inside you that drives you to just kill people like this i and you know thank god i don't know that i it's just nuts how angry how angry you can be to do something like this. It, and yeah, here's the map. So again, I'm zooming in so I can see this, but uh, yeah, there's Auschwitz. So I, okay, there's Auschwitz in Poland. That's what southwest. There was a bunch of them. I wonder why. I'm gonna put my foot in my mouth, but I wonder why Auschwitz is like the most known one because everybody's heard of Auschwitz I guess maybe that's where some of the worst atrocities were committed or maybe they killed the most people I don't know but yeah Auschwitz out of what 20 25 of these bunch of them in Poland whole bunch of them in Germany which was news to me looking at this map geez even had one in France Ugh, I, what a time and uh, if I talk any more on this, we're going to get into a, a religious discussion, and this is probably not the platform for that, so I'll just keep moving. Again, I'm zooming in here so I can read. Henry Stieber convinced the Germans he was an Englishman named Henry Brook. This is a collection of the documents he was issued in somewhere. Included our work papers, ration coupons, immunization and health cards and various notices. I assume this Jude star of David, I've seen that before was maybe something 
they had to wear uh, in occupied territories. Um, okay, moving on. All right. But let's get back to the museum. Sorry. That was... This was uh, actually a hallway I walked down. <laughs> uh, I was looking for something. I actually, this was not where I was supposed to go, but these were Air Force jackets or something, or uh, jackets pilots used to wear through various circuits of aviation. This was kind of out of place because I thought I was going to the World War II hangar and I actually was going to the Cold War hangar, and so I had to backtrack. Uh, yeah, here's more. I mean, look how bundled up they are. This is, you know... Uh, 1943, oh, 1920s to 30s. I mean, yeah, you had to bundle up, man. It, it's cold up there, baby. And uh, you kind of saw it in the last picture. I did not take a picture of each one of these. So, yeah, here's 1989 or later. U2 pilot, yeah. Those guys fly up high. You know, I, I don't think they need that in the cockpit. I could be wrong about this. Somebody please correct me. Uh, but the cockpit should be pressurized. It should be good. I think the whole flight suit, well... Uh, oh man, I might say something. I, I know the flight suit and fighters helps you with like blacking out, readying out. Well, blacking out, certainly. I don't, I don't know if it helps you with readying out. Um, cause yeah, I think the flight suit will like constrict your lower extremities when you're, you know, in a high G turn and it'll try to keep the blood in your head. Um, you know, certainly if you eject it, you know, however high those planes go, you need a pressurized suit or, uh, but I don't know. Any pilots out there, please correct me in this whole thing. I, you know, I love this stuff, like I said, but I am not an expert. Um, yeah. So really, what does the flight suit do? I, beyond what I said, I feel like what I said is not enough justification for flight suit, but could be wrong. All right, here we are. This is finally the world war two hangar. I don't know what plane it is, but I mean, you can see these hangers though. Like they got stuff, they got stuff on the ground. They got stuff hanging from the ceiling. I mean, they're, it is packed to the brim and they got like five or six of these things. And every single one of them is packed to the brim. Uh, they're going to need to build another one for the, uh, you know, planes and drones of, you know, the 2020s and beyond. So I don't know what this is. Uh, it's the placard coming up. There's another view of it. Ah, P-35. Forerunner of the Republic P-47. Yeah, like I said, I don't know what planes that well. Oh, <laughs> this did catch my eye. The Japanese Navy ordered 20 of these things in 1938. So that got me to thinking, um, you know, I wonder how much we supplied Japan and how much they attacked us with their own weaponry. I, I don't know. Uh, I always thought the Japanese Zeros were their own design. Maybe they bought our planes and copied them. You know, China certainly likes to do that. Um, well, we're not giving our war planes to China, but, you know, they're stealing that stuff through the Internet and bribing and the whole deal. But, uh, but yeah, I thought it was interesting that that close up to World War II, 1938, we were still selling Japan weapons. You know, like, did we not see what they were doing? I mean, surely even by then we had some inkling that, hey, this is an imperialistic power that wants to take over the South Pacific. And I don't know. That's seemed kind of an odd choice to me. But, you know, money only sees five minutes into the future. And we do the same things today. <laughs> you know, if somebody can make some money, they're going to do it and forget the implications down the road. Here is a P-36A Hawk with... 86 written on it. That's a good number, right? And here we go. Getting into a day that will live in infamy. December 7th, 1941. Um, have you guys been to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii? If you have not, go. It, it is. I've been, uh, man, when did I go? It was probably almost eight, seven years ago now. Uh, work took me out there, which uh, was by far the best work trip I've ever been on. You know, beats the pats off of Dayton. I can tell. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I went to the USS Arizona Memorial when I was out there and talk about a sobering experience. That is, that was tough. That was tough to go through. They got a big wall there and they got every single name of everyone who died on that day inscribed on the wall. And uh, of course the, uh, the Arizona's sitting there. There's still oil floating on the water. And uh, it's just a very, very sobering experience. There is not a lot of noise out there. People aren't talking. Uh, it's just, it's just very quiet. And uh, it, it's hard to imagine sitting there like in such a beautiful place because it's beautiful. Hawaii is the most beautiful place I've ever been. And it's just hard to imagine the hell that was unleashed there on that day. And uh, here we go. It killed or wounded 3,500 Americans. That's just, it's nuts. It's freaking nuts. But uh, it's something that happened. Man, I'll tell you what, America answered the call. After that, they answered the call. And here we go. So this is Japan's war strategy was that's a major Japanese war objectives planned opening attacks. So yeah, you can see what they, what they were planning here. And it's just nuts to think of. Cause like, I feel like right now you can just you know, cross out Japan, insert China and like nothing would change. <laughs> it's just the exact same Chinese objectives right now. China wants to own the entire South Pacific, uh, for starters, poor Taiwan, I, poor Taiwan. I, I don't think that we're going to be able to stop China from taking Taiwan. I really don't. But that's conversation for another day. But you can see here, um, again, I'm going to zoom in so I can read some of this. So the green things here are uh, secure natural resources, uh, rubber, oil, tin, etc. So I guess there's a lot of oil and rubber and things in the uh, Indonesia region of this. Then you have up top, they wanted to avoid war with USSR. So they did that. They end, ended up becoming, uh, or did they? At, you know, and I take that back. I have no idea. Did Japan ever fight Russia in World War II? I do not know. It's hard to believe that USSR was our ally back then. Uh, clearly, we're still feeling the implications of that today. But, you know, like my US AP history teacher used to say with uh, with friends like Stalin, who needs enemies? <laughs> oh, boy. All right, the other objective, win war with China. And China, actually, you're going to see later on, which was news to me, was our ally dur during World War II. I mean, like I said, you could just totally flip today Japan and China, and everything would still apply. I mean, Japan is one of our closest allies today. And uh, China is the rogue problem child, and it was just totally different back then. Um, yeah, and obviously cut U.S. line of communication to Philippines. So that that's interesting. I guess we had a footprint in the Philippines. I didn't know that before World War II. Um, that was kind of news to me. So established defensive perimeters. So they basically wanted to seal off the entire South Pacific from us. And then, of course, they attacked Pearl Harbor neutralized the U.S. Pacific Fleet on December 7th, 1941. Moving on. So this flag, <laughs> this flag was a Pearl Harbor, and this flag was at the Japanese surrender in whatever year that was, 1946, 7? Oh, gosh. I just made myself an idiot. I don't know when World War II ended, but look at that flag. That sucker is been in the ringer, uh, been through the ringer. Uh, I'm, I'm zoomed in on the placard. Next picture, yeah. USS St. Louis, shout out, baby. Yeah, it was at the it was at Pearl Harbor during the Japanese attack on December seventh, nineteen forty one, and during the formal surrender in Tokyo Bay on September second, nineteen forty five. There you go. So I overshot it by a couple of years. It flew on the USS Iowa alongside occupation force ships. So there you go. That flag is the Alpha and Omega of World War II. 
Here's the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, just scanning through this, it came in two waves. First one started at 7.55 a.m. Then there was the 15 minute lull. Then the next one came uh, 15 minutes after that. <laughs> Yeah, geez, they they inflicted serious damage. Although I I didn't read this here. I think I read that this was on a Sunday. Yes, yes, Sunday, right at the top. And actually, it could have been so much worse because a lot of the soldiers and navalmen were at church. <laughs> so, um, yeah, if they had like done this on Monday or Saturday, it probably would have been way worse in terms of lost personnel. Also, I don't think stated here was a lot of the ships were out on the ocean for some reason or another. Um, does it say anything about that here? I don't think so. I think I heard that somewhere else that a lot of the you know aircraft carrier ships, what have you, were not at port. And I can't remember why now, but basically, from what I understand, Japan picked the worst day to conduct this attack. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously I don't mean to make light of the situation because thousands of people were killed and it disabled a lot of our battleships and things. But uh, from what I understand, it could have been terribly worse, terribly worse. And here's some Pearl Harbor memor memorabilia. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, here's a Christmas card. Look at this. Christmas card mailed on December 5th by Seaman Glenn Baker, and he got killed two days later in Pearl Harbor. That just breaks your heart. And uh, this Japanese, so this thing in the front is a Japanese headband. And uh, moving on, I think the placard gives some more information about it. Yeah, worn by a Japanese flyer killed during Pearl Harbor. And, uh, you know, I mean, what is war? Yeah, it's, it's idiots in power making decisions on the fate of thousands, millions of people below them, their subject. It, it's just awful. Like, again, I'm coming back to this Ukraine war and thinking about what Putin is doing. And I mean, he, a single man, it just blows my mind that a single man can wield that much power. He has power, he has enough power to destroy the lives of millions of people. I would bet if you rounded up all the Russians, all the Ukrainians who have been displaced by this war, that overwhelming majority of them would have no interest. I mean, obviously the Ukrainians, the Russians, the people, you know, this mobilization. I mean... I, I think most people are good. And the people that are not are the ones who bully their way to the top. And then they subject everyone under them to their stupid whims. And that's what we're seeing in Russia. Like, am I mad at Russia? No. I mean, certainly not the people. I, I don't think many Russians actually believe what they're doing is right. Uh, I'm sure there's some of them that do that, you know, Putin and his hardcore supporters, whatever. But I think the great majority of Russia just wants to live in peace. You know, like what, what are they doing? Everything was fine. Why did they do this? And so you, you look at something like this with this headband and, you know, he's a Japanese flyer. I mean, did he believe in his cause here? I mean, I don't know. Enough of them did where they started, you know, flying kamikaze missions into these boats. But, you know, he, he's a person too. He has family, he has people who love him. Inside his headband were sewn small pockets, one of which contained a good luck message. I mean, this headband came from his sister back home, wishing him good luck in the war. I mean, maybe these people are brainwashed so much that they thought what they, what they were doing is right, but it's hard to like look at the individual person and hate them, you know? You can hate the actions of the institution, of the government, of the leader at the top. I mean, if anyone deserves the hatred, it's him. But just looking at the foot soldiers, it's hard to 
hate them. And, uh, you know, this guy died doing probably what he thought was right, or was brainwashed to be what he thought was right. And, you know, he's got a mother and a sister, and it's just, it's awful. Just war is awful. I mean, I've never been in one, but. All right, moving on. First AAF ace of World War II. I don't know what AAF is. I assume Air Force. Uh, sorry, Buzz. We're going to keep moving. Um, there's some planes. You can see them hanging from the ceiling. Ah, piece of a Japanese fighter destroyed on the ground at Clark Field in the Philippines, 1944. Yes, that is an authentic piece of a Japanese warplane. All right, here's another picture of it. This, <laughs> so I have, I've looked at this off camera. I have no idea what this is. At first, my first thought was this is like a flamethrower. But look at the look at the picture closer. This is definitely a guy underwater with like an air supply attached to the boat. And there's like a fish, a sawfish, like going to cut his air supply. And a crab that's going to cut his air supply. It says this is Japanese propaganda. And I guess this is aimed at the Americans uh, or the Allies. You're a long way from home, boys, in hostile territory. But don't worry, boys. Your lives are not in immediate danger. Why? Because we'll not bother with you, small fry. It's much simpler to isolate you by cutting your lifeline. So fire away, boys, to your heart's content. Um, I assume this is taken out of context somewhere. I guess these are Americans trying to liberate the Philippines. That message really doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get the underwater diving metaphor i guess uh, what lifeline are they talking about cutting i don't know maybe if i knew the context this would make more sense but my first initial initial thought is japan bra you gotta work on your propaganda because this this is this is <laughs> if i saw this i'd just start laughing I, I don't even know what this means all right here is 33 I don't know what plane that is. Ah, B-18A Bolo. Hey, you know, I'm a big fan of Bolo ties. I wonder if uh, there's any relation there. Probably not. Uh, Douglas Aircraft Company developed the B-18 to replace the Martin B-10 as the U.S. Army Corps standard bomber. And that is all I'm going to read. So if you want to keep going, pause. What do we got here? MK-38 depth bomb. Oh, this must be a uh, FU to the submarines, I presume. This probably sunk. Maybe had a pressure fuse. That would be my guess. Gets to a certain depth and kablooey. Look at that thing. What is that? Man. Whoever got in that little wire frame and took to the skies in a helicopter fashion had bigger cojones than me. I wouldn't get that thing. <laughs> All right, this is the first A-10 before an A-10 became a thing, I guess. Painted like kind of like a warthog. A little scary looking. Ah, apparently that's a P-40E Warhawk from Curtis. I, I tell you, Curtis, Curtis and Curtis Wright has two S's. That's got to be... Uh, I assume Curtis Wright merged, or Curtis merged with Wright at some point. That's got to be Curtis. Uh, P-40 was the United States' best fighter available in large numbers when World War II began. Yeah, that didn't last. I think they engaged aircraft at Pearl Harbor in the Philippines. What do we end with? P-51 Mustang? Like when, when I think of a, you know, iconic plane fighter from World War II, I think of the P-51 Mustangs. That must have been what we left with. Or something. Look at that engine. Boy, you can see the cylinders in the crankshaft. Uh, right? 2600 Cyclone 14. Can't even read that placard because the glare. And there's one. Looks like we got somebody up top, somebody in the front. Moving on. More planes. More planes. 
More planes. Ah, uh, that must be uh, phase two of the Blue Angels. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, I'm actually looking through these pictures. I'm kind of surprised to see that. Is there a significance to blue and yellow painting? Does anybody in the comments know? Uh, because that's how the Blue Angels are painted. And I wonder what the origin of that is now after looking through these. Because I don't know. Those are Bombay doors on something that are open. I don't know what plane that is. Must be an A-1011. Kansan. Kansan? Standard U.S. Army. Oh, U.S. Army Air Force. That's what the USAF was before the USAF was a thing. WW2 bombing trainer. Oh, trainer. Okay. Damn, they had trainers way back then? That's news to me. About 90% of the more than 45,000 bombardiers trained in A-10, <laughs> AT-11s. Interesting. Uh, those are 100-pound practice bombs. Very good. Ah, this thing. So, <laughs> I got a little special connection to this. It turns out, uh, pretty sure my uncle, we'll call him my uncle, technically my mom's uncle so is that my great uncle i don't know uh but he was i think he he was a gunner in a b-17 and he was kind of tall so contrary to what this says it says the shortest person you usually got in this little ball turret on the tail so i'm not sure what bet he lost to get in this ball turret because he was he was not the shortest guy in the fleet, I imagine, <laughs> or on, on staff. But look at that. Can you imagine, like, getting in an airplane and sitting like that? And it's like, hey, you got to fire this gun. For, you know, <laughs> if you miss, you probably do, you probably going to die. That's just nuts. That's just, that's just nuts. And uh, hats off to my uncle. He died this year. I love him to death. Um, he was awesome. I really got to know him. Uh in the years leading up and uh, I'll cherish that the rest of my life. He was an incredible individual and uh, I just, I can't imagine him <laughs> curling up in the fetal position in one of these ball turrets that were not very big as you're about to, about to see and uh, just going to war, just 50 cal browning them too, just letting loose uh, nuts. That's a ball. Is that a ball turret? I nah, I don't know. It's something. I think that's what it is. Uh, we're going to see one hanging off the B-17 in a minute. So, uh, VB-1 Azen guided bomb. Oh, guided bomb. I didn't know they could guide these suckers in World War II. Um, radio controlled. All right. Like I said, I'm not going to sit there and read that. Uh, here we go with the bomb sites again. So... You know, we touched on these in, in uh, World War One hangar. And apparently they were a really big deal in World War II, which was news to me before I got here. Uh, yeah, you're about to find out that these were some of the Allies' most closely guarded secrets. Um, okay, changing gears to number 24, Strawberry Bitch. <laughs> I don't know what plane this is, but... You know, when you're fighting for the uh, survival of the free world, I think you're allowed to have, uh, you know, some leeway on the language. And I guess that's an engine that, engine and prop that maybe crashed or burnt out. There's a view from the cockpit. Lots of glass. Lots of glass. B-24 Liberator. I guess that's what this plane is. Okay. Boyd in operations in every combat theater during World War II. Great range, suited for such missions. North Africa. All right, what do we got here? What does that say? L4A. Not even a little bit familiar with that one. And there we have it, the iconic B-17 in all of its glory. This was an absolute workhorse for the uh, Allied Forces Certainly the uh, American side 
It saw action in every single theater, I believe. There's one of its one of its engines. By the way, this is a Boeing plane. Here we go. B-17 Flying Fortress Memphis Bell. Yes. Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress flew in every combat zone during World War II. Most, most significant over Europe. Yeah, man, I think I saw another placard later. I don't know if I took a picture of it, but it said they lost thousands of these things during the war. It just... I can't imagine the hell. can't imagine it. Uh, yeah, I took two pictures of the placard here. So again, feel free to pause this and read this if you would like. I'm not going to read it to you. Here's the side of it. So I'm trying to think, <laughs> I should know. I don't know what, you know, what the icon. So the missiles, the bomb, sorry, the bombs painted on the side represent something something some success during a combat mission so these might be like bombing runs or targets destroyed or or something along those lines i have no idea what the actual bombs mean i have no idea what the yellow stars above them mean i have no idea what the red stars above them mean and i have no idea what the swastika means on the side um but suffice to say it means this bomber saw a lot of action and destroyed a lot of gear <laughs> um gear we'll stick with gear for now until i think of something better yeah th this thing unleashed some hell on somebody something welcome to war all right this is a right r 1820 engine uh i'm not going to count the cylinders it looks pretty beefy here we go with the bomb sites going back to the bomb sites oh what do you know memphis bell so the b-17s obviously had this not accurate by modern standards. Highly secret. Gave the USAF a capability unmatched by any other, any other nation at the time. Yeah, so I guess Germans had their Enigma and we had our bomb sites. And there's a picture of one now. Yep, most closely guarded military secret. That's crazy. I'd never even heard of this thing until I went to this museum. Visual bombing of enemy targets from medium and high altitudes. There's the tail of the B-17. And you can see, so on the right, bottom right there, there's one of the gun turrets. So my uncle used to crouch down on that thing. And as far as I know, I, I think I'm recalling that correctly. He was a gunner in that bottom turret. There's a picture of it. Look at that thing. Can you imagine crouching in that thing? And, oh, I for probably hours on end. I mean, I don't know how long these things could fly, but I bet you were there from takeoff to landing, you know, just praying you didn't get shot down. Here are some bomb doors open. Uh, I see a little fan on the tail. I don't know what that is for. I mean, is that to generate electricity maybe? I know they have that. Like if you look at a jamming pod on a modern aircraft, uh, at least the ones that I that I've seen recently, maybe not the newest gen, but they got little fans that hang out in the airstream, and the point is that they spin and generate electricity. And I wonder if that's what that thing did, or maybe it was to stabilize something. I don't know. And there they are. There's a couple of them in the bomb bay. Um, what is that? I can't remember what this blue, yellow, and red thing is. Ah, turbo superchargers. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So permitted you have bombers to fly at high altitude. Yeah. So the idea being, you know, you go to high altitude, you got less oxygen. You need oxygen for combustion. So these superchargers would compress the air, giving you more oxygen to feed to the engine. So you could fly higher. Still gets the combustion you want. Uh, that's the basic premise. Yeah, spinning at speeds are greater than 20,000 RPMs. Turbo superchargers compress air intake, which maintains or increases engine power at altitude. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Holy mess. Look at that. B-17 could take punishing damage and still bring its crew home to base. Man, can, how did these planes fly after this? That's Boeing, baby. 
Good engineers of Boeing. Yeah, here's the uh, bulkheads, spares, and ribs. Four engine bombers. B-17 Flying Fortress and B-24 Liberator. Uh, for out of the range payload, density B-17 is easier to fly. At higher ceiling, it could take heavier damage. Built in smaller numbers, it was more famous than the B-24. There's a picture of the Flying Fortress. <laughs> here we go. So they did have a lot of like authentic Nazi stuff here. And here's here's some of it. BF-109 tail section. There's a Nazi helmet. That was the ME-109 to bomber cruise. Most numerous fighters. So I guess that's a tail section of a f Nazi fighter. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. So, turns out the Nazis were doing some spying, espionage. So, they knew a lot about the B-17. So, Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe. Am I saying that correctly? Probably not. B-17F training diagram illustrating the location of fuel tanks, armor, and arcs of fire for defensive guns. So, they knew the range on all the firing guns. I guess if you had a choice, you would want to shoot for the fuel tanks. And, you know, avoid the armor. And did I not take a... Oh, man. That's disappointing. <laughs> I thought I had a picture, you know. I guess I only took a picture of the placard. That's disappointing. All right. Well, suffice to say, from my memory, yeah, it had like a sphere on each defensive gun. So it knew, you know, it showed you where the weak points were, where the guns couldn't reach, which was like top down maybe. Anyway, moving on. Uh, signal lamps. These were used for communication between aircraft using Morse code without using the radio. So even back then, they were concerned about, you know, being too noisy. We got a flare gun down there. Radio operator telegraph key. Radio operator's equipment included a telegraph key to send Morse code messages over long distance. Interesting. Bomber crew. Yeah, here's some helmets, I guess. And uh, that picture of the guy with a gun. We're about to zoom in on him, I think. Yes. Waist gunner wearing typical body armor for a standing crewman. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, I think this guy basically stood in a B B-17. He probably had the best gunning position in the house. I mean, I'd rather do this than curl up on that ball. Uh, but man, body armor, like, he was shooting 50 cal. I don't think any body armor today is going to be stopping 50 cal. So 50 cal, blow you in half. I mean, you use 50 cal to stop a car. It'll shoot into the engine block. For, uh, yeah, so I think that armor is probably more for uh, psyche than actual protection. But what do I know? What is that? We shouldn't be into the modern stuff yet. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I don't remember taking that picture. Uh, wait, 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 hold on, back it up. Oh, no, 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 that's not a B-17. I don't know what that is. This is the B-17. <laughs> I thought maybe for a second I took a picture of the B-17 from the back, but no, that's just more B-17. Um, I don't know any high explosives. Bomb accidentally detonated. Jeez. It set off 1,200 tons of bombs. <laughs> Hey, sounds like the Ukrainians shooting high Mars at the uh, ammo dumps and cooking that stuff off. Let's go five men. Yeah, um, yeah, you can see the shoe heel right there. <laughs> oh, it's not funny. I shouldn't. Don't know why I left. Uh, gunners. Yeah, here we go. I should have put this on. Let me zoom in a little bit. Is there anything there? Gunners defended B-17 Flying Fortress and B-24 Liberators against fighter attacks with machine guns. Electrically powered gun turrets. That's interesting. You know, they were electrically powered even back in World War II. How about that? And here's some pictures of the gun turrets. B-17 Top Turret. So there's a top turret. I think my uncle, like I said, was in the bottom turret. Uh, top gunner was also the bomber's flight engineer. 
In addition to protecting against attack from above, he had to know all the systems of the aircraft and monitor the engines and fuel and flight. Jeez. That's a lot to keep track of when you're trying to, you know, shoot people before they shoot you. There's the top turret. Ah, oh, there's the camera. Operated when the guns fired, recording aerial victories and strafing attacks on the ground. Very interesting. There's a, another movie camera. Apparently this was headed to the Soviet Union and Major General Robert Walsh said F that and smuggled it back to the United States. <laughs> or uh, just didn't give it to the Soviets, whatever that says. Uh, yes, so here is a anti-aircraft gun from Germany. Um, so this thing used to fire rounds that would get to a certain altitude, I think, and then explode, sending flak, as it was called, shorthand, in all different directions, hoping the flak would hit a plane, you know, injure it, disable it. And uh, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, these things are maybe thinking about making a comeback based on the drone swarms that we now have. Um, yeah, if you could have one of these things guided, you know, computer guided to aim it and just shoot it in the general vicinity of the drone and it gets to that altitude, general vicinity, whatever, and then explodes, you know, like a shotgun shell and sprays crap everywhere. Chances are maybe it'll hit the drone. Um, yeah, drone swarms of cheap drones are really given fits to everybody right now uh, especially ukraine they're just getting bombarded by these freaking iranian drones and you wonder if a simple system like this wouldn't be best to combat that at least in the short term yeah 88 millimeter flat cannon germany's main heavy anti-aircraft or flat gun during world war ii Exploded at altitude. It sent out jagged metal fragments that tore through nearby aircraft. Also left a characteristic black cloud hanging in the sky. Yep. And there's my ice maker again. I apologize. Here's a chart showing some German anti-aircraft weapons. So yeah, they knew how high these guns could fire and they tried to avoid them. It's basically what this thing says, I think. Strategic bombing victorious. Yeah, I just bomb them, bomb them into submission. That's pretty much what it was. Yeah, they blew up Germany's transportation centers, reduced its oil production. Oh, I just can't imagine the level of yeah, so I think this is one of the flak rounds. This this was sitting on the uh on the uh whatever you want to call this thing, the thing that the flak cannon was sitting on. Oh, and those bands around the barrel, if you look back, those those had to do with uh field kills. So that was, you know, along the same lines as the bombs and stars painted on the side of the B seventeen. All right, there's the plane. Strategic bombing campaign accomplishments. Defeat the Luftwaffe. Gain air superiority for D-Day. Force Nazi Germany to you know, commit a lot of resources to repair everything we blew up. Paralyze operations. Guys can read that. Ultimately, we were successful, but... Took a long time to get there. I don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Oh, it's a P-38. All right. <laughs> There's a pink elephant. Boy, that sucker saw some action. Look at all those bombs painted on the side. It's like the uh, stickers college football players put on their helmets in the summer, you know. It's a badge of honor. Look at that. What is that thing hanging from the ceiling? What the hell is that? That thing is... Looks like a blunt-nosed toad. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Glass canopy. 
B26 Marauder. All right. Um, you know what? I'm going to take a break here because I've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes and I'm a little worried my computer might crash. So I'm going to stop, uh, refuel, reload, and I'll be back in the next segment. All right, moving on. What does that say? Shimmy? All right. Shimmy it is. P-51 Mustang. Yeah, I clearly did not recognize it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the iconic plane of World War II. No? Yeah, Mustangs were among the best and, well, and most well-known fighters used by the U.S. Army Air Forces. When did the Air Force start? It must have been post-World War II. Man, I wouldn't have guessed that. Long-range escort fighter, ground attack fighter bomber. So it kind of sounds like the F-18 of World War II, maybe. 1,000-mile range, 1,600. I think that is it from a straightforward viewpoint. Um, yeah, we got to keep moving. I, I just realized, uh, you know, I stepped away. Uh, I'd been talking for an hour and 15 minutes, and we're not even out of World War II yet. So C-47D. <laughs> Don't know anything about this. Pause it to read it. Uh, there's a drone. Yeah, so there's actually drones all the way back to World War II, apparently. Um, look at that thing. Yeah. JB-2 Loon. Buzz bomb. U.S. made copy of the famous German B-1 surface-to-surface pilotless flying bomb used against England. Yeah, those V-1s, man... I, it's great. How did they guide that thing? It must have been like, I mean, no soft. There was no software, no computers. It, it, the whole thing must have been mechanical feedback. It just blows my mind how they could have done that. I'd have to Google that. I have no idea how those things. I mean, I, I know obviously they weren't super accurate, but I mean, just the fact that they could launch them in the direction of London and some of them hit. I mean, terrifying, and how? Uh, oh, that's a, uh, is that a V1? I think that might be a V1. Yes, V1, V2 were developed somewhere on the Baltic coast. Share this research site. Yeah, this is kind of a breakdown of what was inside that sucker. Let's say Allied reconnaissance discovered rockets soon after bombing raids showed German work there and forced them to move manufacturing elsewhere. Uh, here's some sharp part of the hammer machine guns for planes. Parachute flares. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. Spitfire. Oh, yeah. Everybody's heard of a Spitfire. Don't know a lot about it. There's the placard. In the interest of moving on, we're going to move on. Ah, this thing. So this thing reminded me of the of a guppy transport. <laughs> Go back and watch my video on the uh, St. Louis Air Show 2022. And uh, you'll see a big guppy transport there. And I saw this thing, and it just reminded me of that. Obviously, they're totally different. This is a small fighter, guppy transport. It's a big transport plane, you know, on the same tier as C-5, C-17. This sucker is like Germany's jet engine plane. Uh, yeah, rocket power. Oh, sorry, rocket powered, not jet engine, rocket powered. Defensive fighter was one of the most unusual aircraft of World War II. Uh, yeah, had a whole bunch of technical problems. They like to spontaneously combust and explode and kill the pilots. <laughs> uh, the fuel on it drained like a bathtub, so they didn't get a lot of flight time. Uh, yeah, obviously read that. And apparently they used slave labor to build these things. And they think this particular one, uh, I think it's on the placard later, was built by a Frenchman. And they inserted... Easter eggs into it that basically said, yeah, we built this thing to, to blow up and die on purpose. So enjoy that Germans. <laughs> enjoy that Nazis. 
Um, yeah, I didn't realize Germany used slave labor to build things. Like, why wouldn't you just build it wrong on purpose all the time? I mean, I'm sure there was guys with whips and things coming to, you know, kill you if you screwed it up. Um, yeah, here you go. A small stone was wedged. This is talking about the, the uh, rocket powered thing from a couple of pictures ago. A small stone was wedged between the fuselage and fuel tank and supporting strap, which would have caused a dangerous leak. And there was contaminated glue on the wing structure, which caused a failure of the wing in flight. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's easy for me to say, but dude, if I was forced into the servitude, this is exactly the kind of stuff I'd be doing. Defiant French laborer, plant closed. <laughs> my, my heart is not occupied. Boy, is that not the rallying cry for all the freaking areas that Russia has annexed? My heart is not occupied. Amen. What do we got here? Something. This is a jet engine cut cutaway I think uh, yeah turbo jet engine this might have been like the first turbo jet engine or the first jet engine totally revolutionized uh, you know aviation of course powered the world's first operational jet fighter there you go Oh, it began in 1937. Jeez, I didn't know it was that early. Production did not begin. Germany surrendered. More than 5,000 engines have been produced. Wow. Stage axial flow compressor. Yeah, okay. You guys enjoy reading that? Look at that sucker, man. Who the hell can build that? Know what all that stuff does? Incredible. Didn't we ever see this picture? <laughs> short snorter oh yeah this was uh basically collect bills from every country you've been to tape them together and person with the shortest stack buys drinks at the bar <laughs> and you probably don't even need bills to go on with that yeah somebody here has got a whole long thing of bills Look at that sucker hanging from the ceiling. Don't know what that is. Ah, a little helicopter action. Also looks like it's straight out of Minecraft. Very boxy. And whatever that is. I'll tell you, my GoPro... So I took all these pictures of my GoPro. And uh, I love it for video. Absolutely love it. But the pictures, I feel like the pictures are just not that good. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's me. I don't know how to take pictures, but look at this. I mean, that one's blurry. The one before it was blurry. Yeah, I've taken some pictures underwater diving, and they've been, like, terrible for, like, lighting conditions. But but I feel like the video is so good. So I don't understand, like, the difference between the pictures and the video. Uh, the picture's resolution is probably a lot better, so maybe it's less forgiving, you know, in terms of all the things that make pictures and video look good i i don't know but pictures on gopro not much to write home about uh what is this 77 i'm just giving myself audio cues now so i know how to sync up the audio with the <laughs> pictures uh if you look to the left the yellow thing there that is fat man that is an actual uh well actually i don't remember now the uh the one to the left left of that is the first one that fell on Hiroshima, and that was an actual nuclear bomb that they got decommissioned. I can't remember if this fat man was actually real or if that's a reconstruction. We'll find out. Yeah, so you see the thing to the left, to the left of fat man. We'll get to the placard in a second. Uh, but I think they said that was an actual armed nuclear bomb that, you know, obviously it's not anymore. <laughs> this is the inert version. But at least the housing, the shell casing was uh, the real deal. And those are two different technologies, by the way. Um, so the first one that fell on Hiroshima, the one on the left, whose name I cannot think of right now. It flew in the Enola Gay. What was the name of the bomb? All right. We'll, we'll get to it. I took a picture of it. Uh, Box Scoop 29. All right. 
There we go. Box box car. Sorry. Super Fortress. B29 Super Fortress. Oh, Boeing. Shout out. B29 on display. Yeah, B29 is what uh yeah, dropped the fat man atomic bomb Nagasaki. Oh, gee, this is the actual plane. Oh my gosh. I didn't realize that at the time. The B29 on display boxcar dropped the fat man on Nagasaki. Wow, this is the actual plane. Oh my gosh. Three days after the attack against Hiroshima. Man. What a time. I can't even can't even imagine that time. But you know what? It might be coming. <laughs> we are a Taiwan invasion invasion away from World War Three right now. That's all it's gonna take. I might be imagining sooner than I think. Yeah, wow. I did not catch that at the time. So I guess that's on um, the click back just to get another look at it for my own sake. I guess this is the actual plane that dropped Fat Man on Nagasaki. That is freaking nuts. All right, moving ahead. Uh, OA-10, no clue what that thing is. Runways by hand. Okay, yeah, here. Remember, remember back in World War II when China used to be our friend? <laughs> So I remember this. I'm going to you know, read that. I'm going to go to the next picture. Yeah. So this is the, look at this picture and all these people. So they were, this was, they were basically steamrolling runways, uh, against our, you know, to help us against our fight against Japan. That's how much China hated Japan. And, uh, man, well, yeah, I, I think it's safe to say China hated, hated Japan. I, I don't pretend to know all the history there. I, because I don't, but I do know that those two countries historically do not like each other. And back then, Japan was the imperialistic power looking to expand their influence, region control, and China wanted no part to do with that. And so they're actually helping us build runways for our planes. And man, fast forward, what, 80 years, and my, how things have changed. Now, China is the imperialistic power looking to impose their will on the entire South Pacific and beyond, and Japan's the level-headed, level-headed ally to help us, you know, deter that imperialistic expansion. There is a radar antenna for something. Ah, ask and you shall receive the Bendix. A-N-T-P-S-1-B search radar. That's what you're looking at in the previous frame. Lightweight portable search radar developed during World War II. Okay. Like I said, we need to keep moving because this is going to be by far the longest video of my career. All right. There's some radar stuff. Oh, I should have turned that. I can do that now. Hold on. By the time you see it, it'll be turned. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's going to make me save it. Yes, replace. It was turned sideways. Yeah, it was turned right away. More radar stuff. Here's the plane. All right, so there's the atomic bomb. Let's let's get in there. Yes, what was this? Thing? Little boy, that's what it was called. Yeah. So that, take a look at it. When I go to the next one, we're going to find out about it. Yeah, MK1, little boy. First nuclear weapon used in warfare, delivered by the B-29 in Olegay, detonated at an altitude of 1,800 feet over Hiroshima, Japan, on August 6, 1945. Uh, yeah, the little boy on display was an operational weapon, but it has been completely demilitarized, <laughs> I hope, for display purposes. In 2004, Department of Energy repaired and repainted the artifact. So that sucker actually had... It was ready to go. That was an actual, real Tom bomb. And then there's the Fat Man. So th these two things worked on totally different technology, which I think is coming up. You can see why they called it the Fat Man. Uh, yeah, let's read this for a second. Repeat. Yeah, implosion-type weapon using a sphere of plutonium placed in the center of a hollow sphere. Yeah, so the... Uh, Oh my gosh, what was the name of it? 
Um, little boy, little boy was a uranium gun. So it had like a piece of uranium that I think they detonated a charge that shot it into another piece of uranium that caused the fission reaction. Uh, but and this one was totally different. Fat man used used plutonium. Implosion weapon using a sphere of plutonium and a hollow sphere. Yeah, so this was totally different. Uh, one of these, I think it was a uh, little boy that they didn't even test because, I mean, the Manhattan Project was enriching this uranium and they had so little of it that they didn't even test this thing before they dropped it. They were so sure, you know, it was going to work at least in terms of, you know, it was an engineering trade-off. I guess it wasn't 100% sure it was going to work, but uh, they just didn't have enough uranium to test it. So we're like, we are very certain this is going to work. Yeah, but I think the plutonium and fat man, I think they did maybe test that one. I, I could be wrong about that, but I, I'm pretty sure little boy was not tested before it was, you know, put into operational capacity, which is crazy today because you can't even... The thought of putting something in the field that's never been tested is nuts. I mean, they test and test and test and retest things before it becomes operational these days. What does that say? The yellow color allowed observers to easily track the bomb after it was dropped. Oof. All right, moving on. Here's some actual pictures. Yeah, that one on the left, top secret photograph showing workmen Preparing the bomb. Wow. And then you got the uh, mushroom cloud on the right. Oof. P61C. Okay. Here we go. Now we're starting to get modern. Although, <laughs> not yet. So that's a uh, predator, I think. Is that predator? A reaper. That might be a reaper. Oh, I should know that. I think that's a reaper because it's... Big. <laughs> well, that's one of the two. Uh, but I felt like this was out of place because I walked into the next hangar. So this is the hangar after World War II, which I think was the Cold War hangar. It's either Cold War or South Asia, aka Vietnam War. Uh, and they had this thing hanging from the ceiling, which I thought was out of place because, you know, this was not used in either of those wars. So I don't know. I, I feel like these people at the museum are just totally out of room on everything and now they're just like throwing stuff anywhere they can place it <laughs> they probably need to build another hangar moving on ah yes reaper ymq what did i say mq not yeah okay ymq i don't know what the y means yeah yeah i thought it was a reaper i thought it was a reaper yeah predators only hold like two munitions i think you can see all the clusters of munitions under this sucker's hard points all right, 900 horsepower engine compared to the Predator's 115 hour horsepower engine. All right, pause and read. And see, we're back to like the propeller plane. So I, I feel like the Reaper is really out of place. Douglas Sky Raider. Dude, I know I was out of World War II. Unless his pictures just got in some weird order or something. I don't, I don't know. All right, that is a B-52, yes. Look at that, the iconic B-52. That's That sucker is almost 100 years old, and it's going to keep flying beyond that. That is crazy how prevalent this plane has been. Yeah, B-52 Stratofortress. Operational in 1955. It is 2022, almost 2023, and these suckers are still flying. You can rip out the avionics, put in some upgraded avionics, Place the wings. They get their wings replaced. No, not the wings. That was A-10. Uh, B-52s, I think they're getting new engines, maybe. Or just did get new engines. Uh, it's just crazy. These things are still flying to me. They just took part last week or two weeks ago. I think it was last week, actually. In a, uh, yeah, nuclear, NATO nuclear exercise. Like, you know, they do it every year. But this year, it's particularly prevalent because, you know, Bad boy Putin's threatening the world with nuclear war. What a joke. That guy's... No. All right. Not saying nuclear war is a joke. I'm saying Putin is a... 
not a good human being. I, you know, I've done things I'm not proud of, but at least I don't mass murder people, you know. All right. Anyway, I don't know what that is. Sitting next to the B-52. There's some B-52 engines. Revolving cannon. All right. Is that a F-100? Okay. I thought it looked cool. I have no idea what plane that goes into. Don't know what that is. There are some cluster bombs on the B-52. That is a B-52 cockpit. You want to tell me what each one of those knobs and switches? So, you know, there's so many engines on this thing. I think, I think, I think, I think those are individually yeah, in the center console here. That's a throttle, pretty sure. And I think each one of those is an individual throttle for the engine. I mean, that's nuts. How do you, I mean, I feel like I'd want to keep them all together anyway, like, Unless there's an emergency or something, if you're trying to compensate for damage or a lost engine on the other side. I mean, wouldn't you want all those to pretty much be the uh, at the same place all the time? Those have got to be individual engine throttles. They have to be. I, I don't know. Could be wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Uh, but just beyond that, look at all those gauges and switches. And oh my gosh, I mean... I feel like Steve Jobs, <laughs> you know, he he was all about simplicity and things. You know, if Apple designed a cockpit, I wonder what it would look like. I don't think it looked like this. <laughs> but uh, we're getting, you know, we're getting better. We're uh, all these steam gauges, as they're called, analog steam. I mean, they're called steam. Uh, but this is all getting replaced by, you know, what's called a glass cockpit now, which is all touch screens and. Yeah, things have come a long way. Come a long way. Moving on. I don't know what that is. I don't know what I was doing here, except taking a blurry picture. Come on, GoPro. I feel like it'd be better just to take a video and take screenshots from the video, because the video on a GoPro is so much better, I feel like, than the stills. So much better. All right. Uh, again, just taking pictures of the hangar. Nothing in particular. Don't know what that is. B seven B fifty seven B Canberra. Oh, <laughs> so, I went to Dayton with a group of coworkers, and one of them is a neck a uh, ex Navy pilot. So he used to fly Growlers, I believe. And I texted him that I was here, you know, well, <laughs> first of all, the fight between the Navy and the Air Force is epic. If you, if you ever get a chance to listen to an Air Force pilot and a Navy pilot argue, do it. <laughs> it's awesome. It's good theater. Uh, yeah, probably my favorite line from the Air Force side is, the Navy doesn't teach people how to fly planes. They teach them how to crash land into boats. <laughs> And that's true. That's actually, there's a, there's truth to that. So I, I was actually told this early in my career. I, or I probably repeated this at some point, but, uh, next time you're on a passenger airplane, you know, flying somewhere or whatever, pay attention during the landing. If, if the pilot comes in and, you know, at a steep angles and smacks the runway real hard, it's probably a Navy pilot because he's used to crash landing in the boats where <laughs> You have very little room for error in terms of catching that, you know, arresting hook. But if you're in the plane and it comes in nice and smooth and, you know, you're kind of hovering or flying above the air, you know, the airstrip at, you know, five feet and you just gently touch it down, probably flying with an ex-Air Force pilot because they have all the runway in the world that they need. <laughs> yeah, so that, that thought was reinforced when the Air Force pilot was like, yeah, they they just teach you how to crash land into boats. They don't actually teach you how to fly. <laughs> All right. Moving on. Uh, B-57, Canberra. But, oh, yeah, the whole point of that. The the Navy pilot, uh, I told him it was at the museum. He was like, yeah, I've been there before. It's awesome. And he basically, uh, in some very colorful language that I will not repeat, said to go see the B-58. 
And I looked high and low for the B-58 and didn't see it. This is as close as I got to the B-58. Uh, so yeah, I don't know where the B-58 is in the Air Force Museum. I'm going to have to go back and find it. Whoa, where's an AK? Uh, what does that say? Presented to, I'm zooming in here. Presented to Colonel William J. Evans, 31st Tactical Fighter Wing, in appreciation of outstanding air support, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I guess this was a wartime trophy that they decided to give to a commanding officer, and I guess we are in the South Asia Theater now, because that's the only place this rifle would show up in history. Well, the first place it would show up in history. What's it say on the stock? Anything interesting? Uh, no, same thing as the placard. And something with props and guns in the front. Don't know what that is. Nope, don't know what that is. Ah, the Huey. Yes, the iconic Huey. Bell helicopter H1, I think. This thing saw serious uh, playtime in Vietnam. UH-1P Iroquois. Yeah, we got a thing where we name all our helicopters after Indians or something like that. So this is, I guess, the Iroquois, which is news to me. Obviously, everybody knows the 64 Apache, AH-64 Apache. The Apache were an Indian tribe. Uh, anybody want to read this real quick? Another common Huey. Yeah, okay, pause it, read it. I'm not going to. That is a, oh, don't know. <laughs> Whoops. All right. No clue what that is. Please don't fall on my head. Ah, these things. I did read about these. These were like motion sensors or something. Basically, they launched these in Vietnam's neighbor in the, the jungle. And they provided intelligence on when... Ho Chi Minh was resupplying his troops, something like that. Uh, he's in a cover darkness, deep jungle, and bad weather. Yeah, trucks carried, North Vietnamese carried critical supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, nearly undetected. Yeah, so these things essentially were dropped and deployed to uh, detect movement on the trail. That is a CH3E. And that's all I know about that. Don't know what that is. Ah, MIG. Yes. So they actually, I was impressed by the amount of MIGs they had. <laughs> Where did it? Oh, there it is. That's just got to be a thorn in Russia's side. You know, you know, Putin's got to be, they got MIG. I mean, how many American planes do you think are sitting in Russian museums? <laughs> I'm going to venture a guess of zero. And if they have any, they're freaking old. Uh, there are no F-15s and later in Russian museums. That I can promise you, I think. <laughs> anyway, I think we got way more way, way more MiGs than they got. Anything else? Yeah, so the MiG-17F. Look at those intakes, man. So that was like the nose intake. It's such a... It's so ugly. I, I feel like it's someone coming at you with their nose cut off or something. You know, like... You know, heaven forbid, I don't mean that derogatory, but like, look at that thing, man. Who wants, that's just, that's ugly. That's ugly design. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. Uh, whatever that is, looks like an Osprey predecessor that could fit a Jeep in the back. Very nice. Got another big, big 21 PF. Hey. That looks a little cooler, so they put one of them cones in the front. Uh, the SR-71 had those, which adjusted the airflow into the engines in some facet. I assume this is doing the same thing. Don't even know what that is. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Take it back. Is that an F-4? That might be an F-4. Some drone thing hanging from the ceiling. Uh, 3,000 pound bomb. I didn't know those existed. Cool. That's, wait, no. 
Is that the hold on? I gotta back up. No, that's a different plane. Sorry. That that is a what is that? Is that the F4? Oh, I keep, you know, I'm so bad about it. all right. Thing hanging from the ceiling. What's next? Oh my gosh. All right, I gotta know which airframe is the F4. I think one of those. All right, here we go. F4C Phantom 2. So this is an iconic plane. Yeah, developed for US Navy, first flew in 1958. Uh, so I think that second version was the F4C Southeast Asia. Yeah, loaded on to. Wait, what did that say? Let me back up a second. It's air to ground rule. The F4C could carry twice the normal bomb load of a World War II B 17. That's nuts. That's freaking nuts. So you got this fighter looking airplane. I know it had dual rules, but it, I mean, you're not going to see this, but yeah, that's the F4. Um, I don't know what that thing, the first thing I said was an F4 is not an F4. The second thing is the F4. And it's that little, that little fighter jet says it could carry twice the, the loadout of a B-17 bomber during World War II. I mean, that plane was designed to be a bomber start to finish. And you got this fighter jet with like a dual roll mission and it can carry twice the loadout of a B-17. That's nuts. That's nuts. All right, moving on. There's some of the loadout. So I mostly don't know what we're looking at. The thing closest to us, I'm pretty sure, is a fuel drop tank. Uh, the white one with the fins on the nose, or close to the nose, I think is a sidewinder, maybe? It's certainly some kind of air-to-air -air missile. Um, and the stuff below that are bombs. Don't know what kind. Don't know what fuse is in the front. Um, moving on. And here's some getting closer. Oh, yeah, this is like, I guess, the initiation of precision guided weapons. I don't know what all these are, so I'm not going to pretend I know, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. All right, blinding the enemy. Here we go. So this is <laughs> start getting into some EW stuff here, folks. Uh, yep, next. Here we go. Electronic warfare over North Vietnam. That's when this stuff started really coming, coming to age, coming to fruition. Electronic warfare aircraft detected and jammed enemy air defense radars. Small number of their the crews remained in high demand. Yeah, I bet they did. North Vietnamese used radar signals detected incoming aircraft. And we really did not we, I don't think we really had a great technological advantage in the Vietnam Wars. Um, that's a part of history I don't know a lot about. So, like I said, everything I say here, please correct me in the comments. Um, yeah, smart people figure this stuff out. I'll leave it at that. I uh, don't know what that is. Aardvark, okay. F-111 Aardvark. Tactical Fighter X. Moving on. That's quite a beautiful loadout. <laughs> Moving on. Don't even know what that is. Is that a, it's a sight? It looks like something you look through, but maybe not. Ah, here we go. Wild Weasel. So Wild Weasel's been around for a while, baby. Yeah, I guess it probably started in the Vietnam War. The Soviet SA-2 surface air missile threatened to halt air operations over Vietnam. And you know, I think Putin is probably still employing those. <laughs> to suppress and destroy this threat. The U.S. Air Force countered with the courage and skill of the Wild Weasels. Yeah, so I think the Wild Weasels are maybe some of the first, you know, electronic warfare squadrons. Um, I'm convinced you could take, I, I think today the F-16s fill the Wild Weasel role, even though I'd say the Growler is probably right now the best 
um, you know, seed, suppression of enemy air defenses vehicle out there. But, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure the pilots from each realm would correct me. <laughs> but I think today the F-16s fill the Wild Weasel role. And, uh, but the Growlers are straight Navy. I don't, the Air Force doesn't own any. So the Wild Weasels are probably the Air Force's seed role. Even though I think the Growlers probably pack a bigger punch, but. I'll let somebody more knowledgeable duke that out. Okay, don't know what that is. Ah, that is F-22 from the front. Is it the uh, stern? Stern the front? Oh my gosh. Aft. I think aft is the back, right? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Look at that sucker, man. That is, that is, has a smooth profile. As nip tuck smooth profile. Um, yeah, that contoured nose. Yeah, that helps. You know, radar waves just not return to sender, <laughs> which is what you want in a stealth aircraft. And uh, you can't see it, but those engineered those uh, air intakes on each side. Uh, there's some S ducts in there, which. Um, cause you know, engine fans. So behind that somewhere is a jet engine with fans in the front and no part of that is stealthy at all. Um, so modern stealth aircraft, they have to use like an S duct to curl the air around before it reaches the, the engine and making that work. So the engine doesn't get starved of air is very closely guarded secret. Um, because, I mean, that's a huge part of what makes a stealth aircraft stealthy. So, whatever the F-22 is doing there is not common knowledge. I'm sure China's already stolen it. Because that's what China does. Um, but yeah, that's one of the major aspects of a stealth aircraft. That much I know. And augmented turbofan. So, yeah, here's the, here's the uh, turbofan. Uh, the engine for the F-22. Not going to read it. Uh, here it is. Here's the business side of an F-22 engine. Um, you probably know by now. If you don't, here it is. Uh, so they can tilt that up or down. It's called thrust vectoring. Um, I think the idea there is to change, you know, direction without without uh, moving the control surfaces on the aircraft because. You know, it, it is very small. It is very tight margins that keep you stealthy in the air. And if I do something, you know, if I want to turn left or whatever, um, you know, some, they're called control surfaces on the airplane have to move in order for that to happen, you know, in order to make that happen. And once you do that, you change the shape of the airplane and you could, you know, depending especially on which direction you're getting, getting uh, radiated at, uh, you could greatly increase the radar cross section of your aircraft and you could be detected. So I think, I don't know, but I think the uh, thrust vectoring is used to basically allow you to change direction without changing control services, without changing the shape of your aircraft. Uh, Russia, <laughs> freaking Russia, they've come out with 3D thrust vectoring, which means they can point their nozzle any which way they want. So the F-22 only goes up and down. Russia can point it, you know, up, down, left, right, diagonal, whatever. Uh, but really all that does is make for some cool air shows. I don't think there's a whole lot of tactical advantage in an actual fight. Because if you do that, it's like, it's kind of like the same as fishtailing your car, as far as I understand it. I could be wrong, I'm not a pilot. But, I think pilots, when they're flying, they want to keep their energy. And, you know, if you whip out the back end, if you're fishtailing, you know, imagine a car, you're fishtailing, you, you lose a lot of energy doing that, you know? Um, and I think it's the same in the air. When you're thrust vectoring, you're basically whipping the back end out and you're losing a lot of energy. And when you lose energy, you're not moving, you're a sitting duck, you're easy to kill. Um, 
So it's probably not something you want to do on a regular basis. I don't know why Russia decided to do it in all three directions, or I guess up, down, left, right, diagonals, I guess just two axes. Um, but, you know, they're more show than substance, so they can have their 3D thrust vectoring. Google that. It certainly makes for some cool air shows, like I said, but in terms of actual tactical advantage, nah, nah, nothing. <laughs> nothing. All right, moving on. There's the jet engine from the side. There's one of those famous intakes. See, they even got covered up. Um, I think, yeah, this is a real F-22, and they probably don't even want civilians even taking a look inside that air intake. So, keep moving. Yeah, here we go. I mean, this is the most advanced fighter. It's the only fifth-gen fighter deployed in operational capacity today. Uh, is the J-20 considered fifth-gen? I don't think so. Anyway, all right, getting back, getting back to the F-22. Low radar cross section. F 22's powerful radar. Sophisticated sensors. And yep, it can super cruise. That means it can go supersonic speed without using afterburner. That's awesome. And the paint makes it hard to see by the naked eye or heat seeking missiles. That's news to me. I thought they were going to say the paint helped to. Absorb radar emissions, which it does. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's paint, but they de definitely put a coating on these things to, that does that. I have no idea how paint would help against heat seeking missiles. That's news to me. And here is, so you know, stay stealthy. You got to keep everything, you know, carry all your munitions on the inside. So that's what this is showing. The weapons bay door is open. And we've got an air to air to missile here, which looks like some kind of sidewinder, AMRAM maybe. I don't know. That, that's definitely an air to air missile. That much I know. And boom! What is that? That is the. Um, oh shoot! Well, it's not the it's not the Reaper. It's the Global Hawk. That's what that is. So that sucker is unarmed, as far as I know. Um, yeah, this is the thing Iran shot down, shoot, I don't know, five years ago, maybe it was flying in international airspace, spying on Iran and those mofos decided to take it down. And I don't remember what our response was. Probably not much because if it was, I would have remembered or maybe the indirect response to that was taken out their head of their one of their proxy. Can't remember his name now. But anyway, that thing's pretty badass. Although it's not even close, it's not even trying to be stealthy. So you know, I think it's getting close to retirement. Maybe. I mean, the wars we're fighting in the future, you, you just can't. You can't have non-stealthy platforms. I mean, these are good for the Middle East, you know, where the airspace is open, essentially. But again, I keep coming back to the Ukraine war. That airspace is not anywhere close to open. <laughs> uh, it's very well contested on both sides. The fact that Russia has not gained air superiority yet is mind-blowing because... Everybody and their mom thought that they had some pretty solid, you know, service to air missile systems. And it just turns out that, I mean, they do, but Ukraine has been, you know, contesting the airspace as well. And it's glorious because you got this big bully Russia coming in. You got the junior varsity Ukraine and they're just going punch for punch with Russia and Makes me happy. <laughs> All right. C-124 Globemaster. Okay. Ah, look at that. All right. So here's the F-22 we were looking at earlier. Right above it is the Boeing Bird of Prey. So this was a technological demonstrator from the 
1990s, I think, maybe early 2000s. I don't know for sure. I'd have to check Wikipedia. But look at that sucker, man. That thing's, that thing's pretty badass looking, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's got the wingtips tilting down. I have no clue what the advantage on that is. It's got to do something, though. Maybe increase stealth signature or uh, decrease radar cross-section, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that thing came to fruition in the 90s. Because like, I think the successor to that essentially was the Phantom Ray, which was unmanned. So this the Bird of Prey was manned. So you had a pilot flying that thing. Um, maybe that'll be the last manned technological demonstrator. I don't know. Probably not. Moving on. There is the Boom B-2. The iconic B-2. Um, I'll tell you what. I need a refill. I'll be right back. 